our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Tack Mack. Uh, and Dr. Mack is the director of the Campbell Family Institute for Breast Cancer Research at the Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Center and a university professor in the departments of medical biophysics and immunology at the University of Toronto. We're just thankful that Dr. Mack could make it. He's, suppo he's supposed to catch a, f a flight tonight and get the Golden Leaf Award from the Governor General in Ottawa tomorrow. So we're fancy that he's able to squeeze us in. So thank you so much. He's also uh, best known as the lead scientist of the group that first cloned the genes encoding the human T cell antigen receptor, a discovery that provided essential insights into the molecular basis of cellular immunity. In addition, uh, his group was also the first to define the functions of uh, something called CTLA4, a negative regulator of T cell activation, whose studies set the stage for development of checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapies. And Dr. Mack's current research is focused on immune system cell functions and regulation and the role of metabolism and genetic instability in cancer. And currently he is pursuing the goal of identifying potential targets for novel cancer therapeutics. And in this context, he has co-founded Agios Pharmaceuticals, which has recently developed FDA-approved drugs targeting either the altered metabolism of cancer cells or their aneuploidy. So very uh, high fancy things that we're about to learn about. So looking forward to this, uh, Dr. Mack, please welcome him. invitation. Um, I, some of you could say I look like a scientist. Uh, and so I actually cut my hair just to make sure you have some respect for me. <laughs> I used to have many years ago. Uh, scientists are a little bit crazy. Uh, we have all, have you all heard of Archimedes? Right, the guy who was uh, in a bathtub and and showed that uh, you know the the weight of the water that this displayed was equal to the volume divided by the weight, um, something like that. Right, um, he was pretty old when he did that, and I think he shouldn't be playing in the bathtub for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but today, um, I just want to talk about. Science and scientists. Um, okay, first of all, what's the name of this picture? Okay. Where's the pointer? Um, laser pointer is red. Then. Yeah. Okay. Can anybody tell me the name of this picture? It's by a very famous Chinese painter by the name of Wu Kongzhong. Um, Excuse me, lady. <coughs> uh, village? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> A house? A house? Tree? I don't know how many of you actually can be scientists or want to be crazy scientists like me. Two swallows. So that's what we're supposed to do, to see something that nobody has seen before. Something that maybe the big picture is there, but it's that little subtle hint that we can actually. And those two swallows, and this is actually the name, original name, by Wu Kong Zhong. So science is also about tomorrow. It's not about yesterday. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow for us is mystery. Today, if you believe in God, it's a gift from God. And that's why it's called present. Aesop was probably the first scientist, in addition to 
the fact that he was a philosopher. Because what he said was that passion, as it is with fire and water, they are good servants, but bad masters. Now, why I think that he really was the first scientist? Because health is about order. It's about that balance in the biochemical way, in a nutritional way, in a physiological way, that balance between fire and water. <coughs> because there is order after billions of years of evolution we developed order. And disease is when there is this order and cancer at its later stage is chaos. And that's why we need people like Dr. Irish and other doctors. Here in Ontario, we should be very proud because they are outstanding doctors who will bring and we hope more and more that chaos or disorder back to order. So what Aesop was saying is that in normal physiology, he didn't say that, but I'm implying and extrapolating that this normal physiology is good servants. That's when the fire and the water are playing with each other and working as a team. But in pathophysiology, that means diseases, you come bad masters, and let's say in this case, it is the fire that took over. Sometimes it's the water that takes over. And doctors, like Dr. Irish, can take a tumor and cut it out and remove all that, if it has not spread, then you become rehabilitated and we come back to normal physiology. Nineteen ninety one, Saddam Hussein left Kuwait. When he left Kuwait, he set on fire. 261 oil wells as a revenge for him being kicked out. So, first group of firemen came in with a little small fire like this, fire fighting level one, put it out. Just like a doctor would treat you or remove a small tumor and you live happily for a while. Now, there was another group of fire oil wells that could not be put out by 15 firemen using water. And that would require something more. You may need sand, you may need carbon dioxide, nitrogen, whatever. That's level five, two, and sometimes we have to do that when our health fails. Now today I'm gonna to talk about cancer as had been nicely introduced by Dr. Irish. The said day was 2007. On that day, on that year, for Canadians, cancer has taken over as the number one killer. When you have cancer, what do you do? Well, like Dr. Irish does so brilliantly, is surgery. It was first introduced in 1891 by Halstead. He said, if the bad tumor is growing, cut it out and in many cases, brilliant doctors, of which there are many in Ontario, would do that. Group in 1900 started radiation to the tumor. 
and drugs. The concept that a foreign material will be introduced inside a body would then become the curing or the pacifying material that will search through your body for the targets they have to. And then chemotherapy started in 1942 by Goodman and Gilman at Yale University. Does anybody know what was the first chemotherapeutic agent? Please. You smiled. <laughs> well, before then. <laughs> Molies, the French playwright said, doctors pour drugs of which they know little to cure disease of which they know less into patients of whom they know nothing. <laughs> now, the first chemotherapeutic agent was actually, there was a reason for it. Someone knew a little bit about it, and that was Goodman and Gilman. You will never guess. If you had guessed, okay, I will buy you, in the middle of winter, a first class play ticket to Hawaii. No. <laughs> yes! But I didn't say when. <laughs> Mustard gas. He said, what the hell? But there was a reason. Because Stuart Alexander, here with his wife, he was in Italy, in Barry where there were mustard victims. And he examined them and found that their lymph nodes, where your immune cells are, were smaller. Okay. So that means mustard was able to shrink lymph nodes. And Goodman and Gilman said, my patients are dying of lymphomas. Why don't I give them mustard gas? There was a reason. It was not just, let's poison my patients. And it worked, at least for a while. So, when Saddam Hussein left, when all the firemen was all over, there were six oil wells. No matter what they did, it didn't work. What did they do? They bombed it. That's what chemotherapy is. They bombed it. But you can only bomb it for so long for so many diseases. So in that case, it was not to correct, but it was to further aggravate with a graver master in order to save the patient's lives. Obviously, with all good intentions, chemotherapeutic agents have to come to an end. Because you pay me and Dr. Irish and others to understand better the disease so we can tailor make for you the drug that you want with less toxicity that will harm you. We can cure all cancers. 
But the dose of drug that we we'll give was so high, the patient die of the drugs. So there has to be that therapeutic index. And it's done well. Cisplatin, this is testicular cancer by Larry Einhorn. Pancreatic cancer, nothing. This is the survival of the patients over the years from the 1970s to today. But the good news is, actually, the death rate of cancer, female and male, has been coming down. And the reason why we still have so much cancer is because we're living older and because of the statins that rescue many of us, of, of us from cardiac problems in order for us to be older to get cancer. There's progress. Breast cancer, five-year survival in 1960 was 50 percent. Today is 85 percent and rising. Well, there is a reason for these. In the 1970s, doctors found that viruses in chicken that can cause cancer are normal genes that have been mutated to go out of control. And they call oncogenes. So that means oncogene cause cancer. That means it's like a horse pulling a cart. That means if the horse is pulling the cart to come visit you on a neighbor, for carrying neighbors you do not like to be in your house, you shoot the horse. <laughs> don't shoot your neighbors, please. <laughs> oh, don't shoot the horse in any case. So that started what is called targeted agents. 1998, my colleague, Dennis Slayman, UCLA, developed Herceptin. And the green colors are all these. So you can see, well, we've done a lot and things are working. But it's not enough. So you shoot horses, and you can see here, with targeted agents, sharpshooting drugs, further decline. More cancers are under control. Herceptin is what Dennis Lehman, what he discovered was this oncogene, instead of two copies, had 100 copies. When 100 copies, you have 100 horses, which should be driven by only two horses, you shoot the horses, they slow down. And lo and behold, bingo where you could actually, only chemotherapy had 85% of these type of breast cancer, called HER2, with chemo and Herceptin, 85% survive after five years as opposed to 65. And so, you see today, Herceptin, we have losing less people. But these chemotherapeutic agents, these targeted agents, the problem is, in most of the case, they do very well. This is BRAF inhibitor for a melanoma patient. Three months later, you take this, you go home, you say, I'm cured. I'm going to live to see my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. Except three months later, it all come back. You can see there is progress where you only have a few more months and maybe a year of relief, and it all comes back in many cases. We have to do better. Well, the problem is these horses are like 
stars in the sky. There are so many, and we really couldn't do very much. We've done all we can, and however, we have to start thinking about something that is better. There's personalized medicine coming on. We sequence everybody just to make sure we know all the horses that are involved, and we'll give the bullet that will shoot the right horse. And it's not easy, it's tough, but that's our job, and we will do it. So I think moving forward from now, there are no more horses. We know all the horses now. 100,000 patients' cancer have been decoded. There are no new horses. What are we going to do? We're going back to shooting the cart. And what is the cart? The cart, as I said, is the fire and the water that the servants became the masters. We have to find the masters, and it's not one master, it's not two masters, dozens of masters in a very corrupted society. We have to find a way to understand how the different gangsters cooperate. And so more and more research will come. But well, there's one thing that actually Otto Warburg almost 100 years ago said, cancer is a metabolic, metabolic disease. Metabolism, something you eat, something you drink. And actually, we know today that he was right. So these horses that were dragging a cart changed the cart inside, the kind of food that the cart eats. More energy, the kinds of fruits. And say, ah, fruits. I can go to the health food store. I can walk in there and you say, I just got a race in my job. I want to try to cure cancer on my own before they start. You walk in there and you see the health food store person. Okay, and the health food said, oh, uh, excuse me, what do you want to do? Say, I, I don't want to get cancer. Oh, no problem, go to aisle number four on your left, <laughs> pick whatever you want, take it, guarantee no cancer. Okay? And one of those is called glutathione, which is a, it's a water. It's not fire, it's water. Because the idea is you take water to prevent the fire, and the fire is what's causing you cancer because they mutate your genes. They call reactive oxygens. So now, if you pay more attention to it, it says glutathione, essential health with aid, protects you from reactive oxygen, prevents you from the fire, okay? It says cancer. It doesn't, doesn't say give you less cancer. It could give you more cancer. Did it say less cancer? No. You know why I think they're really playing? Because it prevents pregnancy and it gives you childbirth. <laughs> That's a scam. <laughs> and if you have an extra race for the lovely ladies in this room, you Buy it with grapeseed extract, and maybe you will look like that. <laughs> uh, sorry, if I said I, I, should, I, I would be expelled from Collingwood, right? Um, <laughs> so you know what? I'm afraid it doesn't work at all. In fact, clinical trials had shown there is a slight increase in cancer if you eat this. Why? Because it's a fire and the water. So we designed a mouse in which there were water was put out 
and you have more fire. And we put it in three mice cancer, and this is the work of Dr. Harris, who is now at Harvard, was in my lab a few years ago. And we showed that by putting out the water, that means there were more fire, there were less cancer. Why? Some fire killed the cancer cells. And dead cells don't give you cancer. I'll be selling uh, glutathione outside <laughs> at a discount. <laughs> so this is one metabolism, okay? This is called uh, isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. A few years back, uh, we and our colleagues discovered this oncometabolite. That means it's a metabolite that causes cancer. And we did a lot of animal models to show that it actually caused leukemia in mice. And then we started a company together with the CEO of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute and the Cancer Center Director of Cornell University. The three of us started the company and we made two drugs. And lo and behold, they work by just changing the metabolism. You can see here, patient with 80% blast, leukemia, acute myeloblastic leukemia, very bad. The number of cancer cells come down, and if you don't take the drug, you die like this. If you take the drug, half of them live a little bit longer, but another half, this, patients are out three years without any sign of disease by just changing the metabolism. And how did we find it? We looked for the fire and the water. There are no oncogenes, no horses, just the cart. Both drugs have been now approved, one August 17, another in July 2018. DNA repair. What's my time? How's my time? One thumb? <laughs> 15 minutes. Okay. DNA repair. Now, our DNA needs to be repaired. Women that unfortunately inherit the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene have very high instances of breast and ovarian cancer. 70-80% in lifetime because these are repairing your DNA. When you can't repair your DNA, you get chaos. Your DNA should be 48 chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. But look at these, these, these cancers, breast, kidney, ovary. This is 46 chromosome. Look at these cancers. They have many, many chromosomes. Children born with three chromosome 21 are Down syndrome, trisomy 21. Children born with three chromosomes 13 or 18 die within two to three weeks. And yet these guys get away with murder to kill us with more than 46, more than 100. How do they get along, get, get away with it? They get away with it because they compensate the counting machines that count the number of chromosomes, that count the number of ropes that separate chromosomes called spindles, that's here in green color, the blue color of the chromosomes, right? And we found these drugs and we made targets and we made drugs against them, okay? And Lots and lots of work. Each, we made 3,000 compounds over seven years. And then when we treat them, you can see that they completely cannot count anymore. 
they ended up with tons and tons of what is called centrios. We put them in the clinic. Fortunately, not toxic, even up to 168 milligram, and that we are getting some responses about 48 and 72. And you can see here one colon cancer, ras mutated, that is resistant to pretty much all the existing therapy had the tumor shrinking and patient still alive two years later. The second drug, again, at very low concentration, we're seeing tumor shrinkage. This is a liver cancer and this is a ovarian cancer. So again, it's the fire in the water that we are actually going after. And we're now ready for phase two clinical trials and with just luck. So my last 10 minutes, the immune system. We developed the immune system almost for sure to compact pathogens like bacteria and viruses. But it's that when you get that fire going and the water coming in and the fire going and the water coming in and the fire going and the water coming in, it takes a long time to get started and to end, you end up with a lot of different side effects, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, neurogenerative. That's the price we have to pay for having an immune system to kill the germs. But cancer has been pretty difficult because that balance doesn't allow us to find that cancer is different from a normal body. This is, a, this is a textbook that, that I wrote a few years ago. Um, don't, don't bother buying it because you will not understand it. Uh, <laughs> buy it only if you think the cover is so beautiful. <laughs> buy 10 copies, what the heck. <laughs> now we know cancer is caused by pathogens. Cancer is caused by carcinogens, like smoking. But there are very few things in the cancer, the immune system say, hey, this is part of a virus, except in some virus. So targeting cancer has not been easy. Um, 30 somewhat years ago, uh, this is actually Dr. Mark Davis, um, who was actually in Toronto and left last night. And this was me. So. You see, things do happen to people over time. <laughs> um, I'm much better looking, right? <laughs> so the two of us discovered the key to the immune system for the T cells. It turned out there are 10 trillion of them going around saying, are you a virus or are you part of yourself? Are you a bacteria part of yourself? Right? Because if you're a virus, you're a bacteria, they go, doom, doom. That's it. But sometimes, of course, multiple sclerosis would be these immune cells going into the brain and go chung chung, and you know, rheumatoid arthritis, your joints go chung chung. Right? So that's bad. So we need to know. So there are 10 trillion keys, each recognizing a little piece of the universe. And then our laboratory discovered there was a break. And we also discovered there was an accelerator. But what we didn't discover, and that I would, did not have the insight, that if you cover the break, the car doesn't stop, and it keeps raging. But my friend here, Jim Allison, what he did was he put the break out of order, and the tumor shrank because the immune cells did not stop and keep killing. Of course, there are side effects, but you can see tumors are shrinking. You unleash the break, the immune cells start shooting somewhat inadvertently and randomly, but in that process, it won't work. 
It will work in some cases. So, but what is important? Remember, there is this tale. These patients, in addition to buying those several months, these patients are now out five, six, seven years without relapse. Why? Because the immune system remembers. <coughs> you had a shot when you were five years old for polio virus, and today you can drink a gallon of polio virus, nothing will matter because your immune cells say, I remember. So when the cancer cell comes back, they remember and they kill. So <clears throat> there was a proof for many, many different cancers now, and they won the Nobel Prize last year. Amazing. But the story still begins. We have now know how to put some cancers into remission, but a lot still don't know how they work. So the work will start coming. It's like sushi. You've got the rice. If you've got nothing else, you've got to eat that sushi with nothing in it. And it's doing something, but what are you going to add on top that will make it even more attractable or attractive? This is myself. This is my sushi chef in Toronto. Unfortunately, he retired this, um, early this uh, year. And so a lot, a lot of 2,000 clinical trials are starting to see what to put on the sushi that will make it even better. Now, here is one. You can see here, if you would put one drug, two drugs, and if you put two, three dr two drugs together, you get a little bit more. But it's not always that good because these patients have more toxicity. So we have to nonetheless keep struggling. Others, one drug, two drugs, the same as one drug. You buy nothing except toxicity. So this 2,000 trial is going to go, but let's step back and think. What happens? How, how, how does the tumor evade the immune cells killing them? So here is the tumor. Little red dots are the immune cells killing. And if you kill them all, Happy face. If you don't kill them all, you lose. Now, you do not lose by, I'm losing. If you lose here, there's a desert. And then there is a wall. So what do we do? We do a lot of machines, a lot of everything. We can throw in millions of dollars of new buildings, new machines, high throughput <coughs> this, high throughput that. But remember, who knows Richard Feynman? I think he's the greatest guy. I met him twice at Caltech when I was quite young, when I was still a student. He said, when you're going nowhere, working with a slow technology, developing a fast technology only gets you nowhere faster. <laughs> so you still have to think, OK? Who's been to the Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles? Highway 405, driving up, it's on the left. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Who has been there? Thank you. Did you know the first piece of art they wanted to acquire? It was a Kurus. 1983, Paul Getty Museum started. They wanted to buy a Kurus. There's only 200 left that is in perfect condition. They found a Swiss doctor in Switzerland who said his father was a German, and they stole one from the Greek during the Second World War. It's good for 
22 million dollars, you can have one. So they bargain and bargain and bargain at the end, nine million dollars. Okay, I said, I'm, what am I buying? I said, no problem, I'll send five chemistry professors, three anthropologists, five artistic professors, and after six months, everybody signed authentic, authentic, authentic. And it was being displayed in New York as, da da, Paul Getty Museum's first piece of art. And one lone artist walked by, art collector. He went and talked to the boss. He said, It's a fraud. He said, How do you know? I have 15 professors authenticated. It's a fraud. He said, Why? I feel repulsed. Is that it? And he was right. It's just like the two swallows. You have to have the instinct. It's a beautiful museum. You go there now, you won't find it because they didn't pay for it. <laughs> it's actually in this book that many of you read called Blink Thinking. But you can do screens, and with the lovely screens, and they make a lot of difference. We find clin correlate with clinical data, and we go on. Now, finally, this wall. This wall. Oh, yes. This wall here. This wall. What does that wall remind you of? It's a wall, and this wall is actually what is called macrophage, a myeloid cell. Okay? And you can see here, these are the killer T cells trying to get in the tumor to kill these guys, right? They can't get in because there is a wall. So it's almost like this layer of macrophage. It's the wall that separates the Greek soldiers from getting Helen of Troy. Scientists are now searching for the microscopic Trojan horse that can break through that wall. So beautifully put. It was me. I said that. <laughs> when New Yorker magazine called me and I said, this is New Yorker magazine, right? You put on a tie to read it. <laughs> so I gave them some kind of like stuff, and they printed it. I, was, I, I, I became famous for about two weeks. So, who's the Trojan horse? I'm going to end with the Trojan horse. Who breaks down the wall? Okay, one final quote from Otto Weber. Science progressed not because scientists changed their minds, but because scientists attached to erroneous view die and are replaced. <laughs> well, young people have to wait till I die before you go, all right? 1849, exactly 170 years ago, a German doctor, he did was, he stimulated the nerve in a dog. You have a nerve? And he saw the spleen moved, okay? So nerve is the brain. Spleen are immune cells. That was a dog. Three years later, there was a guy named Henley, another doctor. He stimulated the nerves of a decapitated human and saw the same thing. But don't try this at home. <laughs> what the heck was he doing? But nonetheless, eventually was shown the brain sends a nerve into the spleen. Excuse me. Immune cells doesn't need your brain to tell you what's going on. Okay, there's a chemical called acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. Okay, as you sit and I look at you, you look at me, trillions of all your nerves going on. It's just like the telephone wire that sends messages. 
is called acetylcholine. And the enzyme that makes acetylcholine is called CHAT. Okay? So this neurosurgeon I met 10 years ago in New York in the Metropolitan Club, he was sitting next to me, and I said, sitting next to a surgeon, oh my God, like, Dr. Iris, that's great, sitting next to a neurosurgeon. What if he's the guy who does the ca decapitated human? <laughs> and we found the nurse were talking to the immune cells through the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. You can see here, little green dots, okay? And then I went to Alabama to give a talk. The students invited me, and I met this brilliant um, American doctor called Maureen Cox. And I said, please, you're so bright. Let's come to Canada. He said, how long? I said, three years. You'll be famous. Or you go back to Alabama. So talked to her into that. And so what she did was she now looked at how much signals are there in immune cells from the brain. Okay? Normally, these T cells have nothing. But after she infected the mouse with the virus, look at this. It goes from here to there. They're blasting away. When the T cells saw a virus, they're blasting, blasting away. That means your brain actually telling your immune system what to do. Okay? But this is my granddaughter. Right? And this is, of course, a gin. Very nice. Hendrick, I really recommend it. <laughs> but it's this correlation. Right? We found a lot of neurotransmitter in immune cells after virus infection. It's just correlate. It didn't say that the neurotransmitter is doing something. It just says it's there. So then Maureen spent another two years, that means five years in Toronto. She's leaving next week back to the States. She removed the neurotransmitter from the immune cells. Now, the immune cells have no neurotransmitter. Of course, your brain needs neurotransmitter. Your brain, you know, if we have no neurotransmitter, we'll be all lying on the floor, right? And after she did that, and she infected the mouse with the virus, here the virus has cleared the blue dots. Without the neurotransmitter in the immune cells, you cannot remove the virus. And so, after all, that wall and the Trojan horse is a message from your brain. This was in New York newspaper, Toronto. I went to Spain. It was on the front page of the newspaper called El Payas. And all my friends from South America, everybody called and said, you finally showed that Rudolf Wagner, who saw in 1849 that when you touch the nerves, the spleen moved, you finally proved it. So you can see it's somewhat of a light way of telling you a story that is the blood and sweat of thousands of doctors like Dr. Irish and a few scientists that have really over the decades since Pasteur started it, since Archimedes. This is only the tip of the iceberg and thank you very much.